so welcome everyone uh, to a free event that's put on by uh, the AES committee, uh, the New South Wales committee. My name is Laura Baker and I'm a principal at ASL Allen Consulting and also a member of the New South Wales committee. First, before we get uh, any further into today's session, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, that's where I'm based today, but also to acknowledge uh, the traditional lands on which you meet with us today as well. Um, so I wanted to pay my respects to traditional custodians of the lands um, and to acknowledge their deep connections to this country. As I said earlier, um, and for those that are still joining us today, um, please acknowledge where you're coming from, um, where you're joining us today in the chat. So the AES, uh, just a little bit about the society, it aims to strengthen and promote evaluation practice and theory. Um, so that the use of evaluation makes a difference broad, more broadly in our society. Um, I'd like to encourage all non-members here today to join the society and always happy to have a discussion about what that looks like um, at another point in time. At the end of today's session, we'll have a quick feedback survey where you have the opportunity to give us some feedback on how this session went um, and to suggest some topics for the future as well. And we always like to take uh, input from from the community and hear what you really want to know um, so that we can inform our sessions. Based on that past feedback, we're trying to make these events as interactive as possible. Um, and that's really helpful from what we can tell in promoting shared learning and then also networking. So giving you the chance to meet up with other members of the community. So to support this, we encourage you to turn on your video and engage in the discussion. Um, there'll be an opportunity after the presentation to have both a Q&A session with our presenters, but then also to join breakout rooms and have that discussion in smaller groups as well. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Cherie Perth and Victoria Baird from Mission Australia. Um, so Cherie is the Impact Measurement and Evaluation Manager and Victoria is an Impact Measurement and Evaluation Specialist. And they're gonna be speaking with us about Mission Australia's multidisciplinary approach to monitoring evaluation and learning. So Cherie presented this talk at a standing room only room at the AES conference recently in Brisbane. Um, and they've kindly joined us today to present this talk again um, and to share their passion for Mel more widely. So I'll hand over to Cherie and Victoria to walk us through this. Thanks, Laura, for the introduction. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming along. Um, we're really, uh, I guess, pleased to be with you here, here with you today to share with you um, some of the journey that we've been on at Mission Australia to establish an integrated, organisational and multidisciplinary approach to monitoring, evaluation and learning, uh, which I will call uh, Mel moving forward for the webinar because it's much easier to say for everyone. Um, before I get started, though, if we go to the next slide, Vic, I just really, like Laura, want to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which all the lands that we're meeting on today. Um, Vic and I are dialing in from a Gadigal and Gurungai land, which is in the southeast coast of Australia, um, which is uh, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and future, and also extend that acknowledgement and respect to all First Nations people who are dialing into the webinar. So in terms of what we're talking about today, um, as Laura mentioned, this is going to be a bit of a rerun of the presentation that, that I did at the AES a few weeks ago. The big difference, though, is we've got lovely Vic, who is joining us in my team. Um, and Vic has really been integral um, in the development of this work, um, and particularly in establishing the homelessness monitoring, evaluation and learning cycle. So really awesome to have Vic here. Thanks, Vic. She's been on the secondment for a few months, so I worked doing to coming along and just sharing her insights and her experiences with us as well. Um, so essentially what I'm going to do is I'll start out by setting the scene. Um, so talking you talking to you a little bit about Mission Australia and also the homelessness and housing context in which we're working. I'll then give you an overview of our Centre for Evidence and Insights. Uh, but the main component of the presentation is really going to be us providing you with some practical examples of how we are working with a range of different people with different experiences across different disciplines to evaluate, uh, sorry, to monitor, evaluate and learn all about our homelessness services. 
Um, and at the end, as Laura said, we want this to be interactive. So uh, please, if you've got questions along the way, pop them in the chat. But at the end, there'll also be an opportunity for you to ask us anything that you want to know. So I'll get started, I guess, with, uh, I guess, setting the scene. So for those of you who may not know, Mission Australia is a large, national, uh, diverse organisation. Uh, we have the goal of ending homelessness and ensuring that people um, and communities in need can thrive. We have over 2,000 employees and offer uh, over 400 different services across the country, um, which includes 78 homelessness services. Um, what we're seeing in our services, um, and we're seeing it every day, unfortunately, is that there's a growing need and growing demand, um, particularly in the homelessness and housing um, services or the programs that we're delivering. And there are a few things that are happening in the communities that we're seeing and that we're working with. Um, first, there is an absolute stark shortage of social and affordable housing. Uh, we've got the skyrocketing cost of living, which we're all experiencing, but also, I guess, um, our most vulnerable people in communities. But we've also got really inadequate levels of income support from government. So all these factors, um, particularly over the last two years, have really combined to escalate what was a homelessness and housing situation into a national housing emergency. Um, we can tell through the ABS data that we now have over 100,000 people who are experiencing homelessness on any given night, and even more people who are at risk of homelessness if they don't receive support from community services um, such as ours. Um, we can also see in our own data, we recently released a homelessness impact report, uh, that there has been over the last three years a 26% increase in demand for our services and a 50% increase of people who are seeking support after they have actually become homelessness, homeless. Um, so really, really stark and alarming figures that we are facing in this country. So what do those stats tell us? Um, from our perspective, what they tell us is that it's absolutely critical for government and for non-government organisations to use data, to use evidence-based practice um, and also innovation to find out what's working, but also what's, what, what's not working um, and what can we be doing to end this um, emergency that we're facing. But we can't do it alone. Um, and that's what this presentation is all about, uh, that we're going to talk to you about. Um, we can't do it alone as evaluators. Uh, we can't do it alone as non-government organisations. Um, what we really need to be doing is working together across different disciplines, across different organisations, but also across different systems um, and really using uh, the power of MEL to, re to drive positive social change. So to address this context, if we go on to the next one, um, in 2021, Mission Australia formed the Centre for Evidence and Insights. Uh, the vision of the centre is to inspire curiosity for evidence that leads to learning and action. And you can see there's a picture of us on the, uh, the left-hand side of the slide there. Um, we were having a bit of a giggle, Vic and I, yesterday because we actually were, were not there when this picture was taken. Uh, so what you can see at the bottom uh, corner, bottom right-hand corner, is we've photoshopped ourselves in. So it doesn't look suspicious at all that Vic's got a cat on her shoulder <laughs> or that it's my team's picture. But we are part of the Centre for Evidence and Insights um, and we are a big multidisciplinary uh, team. So uh, a critical function of uh, the centre over the last few years has been the establishment and the implementation of an integrated organisational and sustainable mail system. Um, and the aim of our system, which you can see on the wheel on the right hand slide, is uh, four things we're trying to achieve. Uh, firstly, we want to be measuring our impact. So we want to understand deeply if and how our services are contributing to outcomes for people, uh, for families, but also for communities. We want to be driving excellence and we want to be doing that really through our monitoring processes. Uh, and we want to be finding out what's working really well so we can do more of it but also finding out what may not be working so well so we can address any barriers and any, any challenges as quickly as possible. Thirdly, we also want to be using MEL to build a really strong evidence base. Um, so we want to be doing that through conducting rigorous evaluations uh, to ensure that we're not only delivering services, but also investing in services that we know will have the greatest impact. 
And finally, most importantly, for anyone that knows me, um, we also want to be sparking action. So we want to be learning. Uh, we want to be sharing evidence. We want to be sharing data uh, within our own organization, but also more broadly with the sector. So there are kind of big picture aims. Um, to do that though, to really establish that system, what we've done is we've taken a multidisciplinary approach. So the centre brings together different people with different experiences across different um, disciplines, uh, really focused on creating that enabling environment for male activities. We have researchers, I'm gonna forget people, but we have researchers, we have evaluators, um, we have data scientists, we have business intelligence, we also have a statistician now in, in our team. Um, we're all really working together with that common goal of uh, looking at ways that we can gather insights and evidence um, to end homelessness. So that's, I guess, the, the big picture and the scene setting. Now what uh, we're going to do is I'll hand over to Vic and uh, we're going to start talking about some of those practical ways that we are bringing together uh, different people uh, in terms of the implementation of our homelessness mail cycle. I'll hand over to you, Vic. Thanks, Shree. Um, yeah, so as Shree said, I'm going to uh, talk first about how we set up our monitoring system and um, how we worked with people across our organization to do that. Obviously, we want to have access to as much data as possible, but everyone who actually works in the services is really busy. They've got lots of competing priorities and data collection is never top of their list. So uh, we want to make sure that whatever it is we're asking them to collect is actually useful and that we're focusing on the right things. So um, at Mission Australia, we have this concept called flagship service models, um, and they are developed by a team called Service Design and Innovation. And so they have really formed the foundation that we build upon with our male framework. So with our homelessness and stable housing support flagship, it has a theory of change. It articulates the core activities, critical success factors and expected outcomes that we want to monitor across all of our homelessness services. And that was developed by the service designers in collaboration with practitioners, managers, people with lived experience and representatives from the impact measurement and evaluation team. When it came to developing the monitoring framework, we wanted to make sure that the outcomes that we were measuring really were the things that were important for the people accessing the services. So even though we'd already had some um, client involvement in the development of the service model, we also undertook some additional consultations with clients from different states uh, representing different demographic groups. Uh, and we actually paid them for their time to explore, you know, what are the things that are important for them in terms of the outcomes that they want to achieve when they get in touch with our homelessness services. Um, and it wasn't just a sort of tokenistic, we actually did really take on board their feedback and it led to um, some adjustments to our monitoring framework. So one of the things that really came through in the interviews uh, was the importance of both physical and mental health. So that was something that we'd kind of touched on a little bit in the framework, but it came up so sort of frequently and so strongly in the interviews that we knew that it was something that we needed to focus on a little bit more. Um, so we did incorporate that um, into the monitoring framework. Another important part of having the clients involved in the process is it really helps us to communicate um, with our practitioners because if the practitioners on the ground aren't collecting the data, we have nothing to monitor, we've got nothing to analyze and evaluate. Um, and generally speaking, people who work in you know, our sector, they care about people. And so if we can sort of show them how this monitoring framework actually links back to the people that they work with and the things that are important to them, it really helps to get that sort of buy-in um, from the practitioners and helps to get them on board uh, for how important it is. And sort of building that culture with our practitioners has been a really long-term process at Mission Australia. Um, we sort of started, I would say about seven years ago as we started to roll out our impact measurement program, which is uh, what we call our national approach to measuring client outcomes through surveys. Um, we center it around subjective well-being, but then we add in other um, additional service specific measures into the surveys. And through that impact measurement rollout, we recruited um, around 200 impact measurement champions across the country. So as Cherie mentioned, 
Uh, Mission Australia has over 400 services across the country. And although our impact measurement and evaluation team might seem quite big compared to some other organizations, when you think about the fact that we have 400 services to support, it's not enough for um, us to actually provide that one-on-one -on -one uh, support at a service level. So that's where our champions can come in. They can be those representatives on the ground. That's the first point of uh, call for any practitioners that might have questions about um, their impact measurement or MELS. Um, and they really help to embed that um, measurement culture and practice and help practitioners to see how the data can actually be used in their day-to-day -day interactions with the people that they support. Another really key uh, thing for us at Mission Australia is the way that we work with our IT teams um, and the business intelligence team. So uh, we have a data lake. Yesterday I was learning about data lake houses. That's a whole new concept to me, but we used to have a data warehouse. Now we have a data lake. Maybe we're going to have a data lake house. Um, but all of our survey data um, that feeds into the data lake, all of the data from our client record management systems also goes into the lake. Um, and so because we have it all in that centralized location, we can then combine it together um, and report it in different ways. So we work with the business intelligence team um, and they can create all these amazing dashboards that um, can feed into external funder portals. So we can sort of report directly to DSS Data Exchange. We can um, report to AIHW and the primary mental health care minimum data set, all these funders that we have. So it really reduces the burden on program managers because they don't have to sort of manage all of that reporting themselves, but they have sort of validation reports where they can check what's going to be sent, fix up any mistakes before it goes. Um, and then we also have internal reports that um, everybody ha can have access to. And another great thing that we have been able to achieve with the help of our business intelligence team is creating our mega mail data sets. So, um, for example, with our homelessness and stable housing support mail, uh, we have a data set that gathers together all of the information from our homelessness services over the last three years. Um, and it's just growing every day. It gets updated um, in near real time. Uh, so it currently has uh, over 25,000 records and around 500 different variables that we can explore. So obviously that's a really strong foundation that gives us lots of different options um, for how we want to explore the data, what sort of different techniques we might want to apply um, and different approaches we could take. So an example of that uh, in practice is, as Sheree mentioned, our recent homelessness impact report. Um, and our wonderful statistician Sayali got to play with the data um, and what we could see when we just sort of looked at the monitoring data at a high level was that our services were really effective at supporting people at risk of homelessness to maintain their housing. Um, so that was a really great win, a great thing that we could celebrate. Um, but what we could also see was that if people came into case management when they were already homeless, it was very difficult for us to transition them into long-term sustainable housing for all of the factors that um, Shuri kind of described earlier. It's just really hard to move them from uh, homelessness to housing. But what we wanted to understand was, are there any factors that we can control that are more likely to lead to somebody actually exiting homelessness? So with the mega data set, data set um, Sayali was able to do um, a predictive regression tree analysis and was able to identify two strong predictors of a successful outcome for people experiencing homelessness. And those were the length of time that people were engaged and the intensity of the support that they received. So um, as you can see on the slide, um, in general, less than a third of the people who were homeless, who accessed case management, exited homelessness. So it's 31% of people. If we could keep them engaged for 4.2 months at least, uh, then the likelihood that they would exit homelessness increased to 49%. So nearly half of them actually exited homelessness if they stayed engaged for that amount of time. And if during that time they received at least 27 instances of support, their likelihood of exiting homelessness increased again to 55%. So that gave us some really practical, useful insights that we could share with our services that they could then apply in practice. You know, how do we keep people engaged for longer? How do we make sure that they're getting that intensive support? Because that's going to be more likely um, to lead to that positive outcome. 
And we were able to do that with this routinely collected data without sort of undertaking a big evaluation or asking our staff to collect any additional information that they weren't already collecting. It was all based on information that they just collect in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and we could share that not just with our own services, um, but more broadly across the sector. So um, Cherie is now gonna talk a bit about uh, some of the evaluation work that we're doing. Yeah, so the next component of the cycle is um, all about evaluation. So we have, uh, just I guess to manage expectations, we have spent the last few years really setting up that strong and sustainable monitoring system. Um, what that's enabled us to do now is to really uh, identify high priority and strategic evaluation projects that we want to be undertaking, really building on that existing data set that we already have. Um, we have an annual evaluation work plan, which we update um, in collaboration with community services every year. We've got around, um, I did count it last night, I think we've got seven uh, homelessness evaluations, which are actually happening within this financial year um, and into next financial year. But I just thought I would identify for you three of the projects that we've got going on. Um, and these are uh, collaborations with external uh, research centres um, and also the government um, in terms of us evaluating some of our services. So the first evaluation that we are pursuing, and we've been working on it for oh, about 18 months now, but it's finally got through ethics, uh, is a partnership, a partnership with the Life Course Centre up in Queensland. Um, and they're essentially going to be looking at our mega homelessness data set that Vic spoke about, and they're going to be looking at uh, which service, homelessness service models work for whom and in what context. So the first phase, which hopefully will kick off uh, shortly, is really just going to be descriptive analysis. Um, but the long-term vision is that we're going to be able to do, to do some more sophisticated um, analytics on it. So, for example, doing some matching or looking at we, if we can isolate the impact of different service models for different people. So we're really excited about that project to get it started. Um, the second collaboration is actually with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Um, and we've got a few projects on the go with them at the moment. And those projects are all about uh, looking at what happens uh, to people who receive a service from Mission Australia once they leave our service. So the interactions with the broader homelessness service system. Um, and for us, that is really exciting because it's the, the black box. Uh, we have no idea or no visibility around um, what actually happens to people once they exit our services. So being able to look across the service system will give us a really good picture of, I guess, that kind of longer term impact. And lastly, which a lot of people were very interested in at their ES conference uh, to have a chat to me afterwards, um, is a collaboration that we're starting with the New South Wales Better Outcomes Lab. Um, this is actually going to be a hybrid evaluation, which is looking at exploring our youth homelessness services, so um, really having an early intervention lens. Uh, it's going to have two components. One will be an internal evaluation where we're looking at kind of the processes and implementation of our services, as well as short term outcomes. Uh, but the partnership piece, which is really, really, really exciting, um, is all about doing some data linkage. So accessing data from the New South Wales Human Services data set. And that's going to enable us to get an understanding of uh, the longer term impact of early intervention programs, as well as hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, to create a comparison group um, so we can actually uh, attempt to isolate um, the outcomes and longer term impact of our homelessness services. So that's kind of three examples of like the high priority evaluations that we're um, conducting. Really interesting, these are actually the three I've highlighted are collaborations. Um, so they're not evaluation projects that we're actually commissioning. Uh, we've been reaching out to a range of different partners with similar goals um, as us and really just having those conversations around how can we utilize the data that we have, um, particularly around uh, reaching our strategic goal of ending homelessness. Back to you for the last part. <laughs> the most important part of all. Most important um, part. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about learning the last part of our mail cycle. Um, so, as much as we might enjoy monitoring and evaluation and diving into data, it's really kind of pointless unless we actually put things into practice. So, that's why um, we believe that learning is actually the most important part of all of this. Uh, I spoke a bit earlier about those uh, BI dashboards that um, our team create. 
they're not just used to create things like our mega data set or to report to external funders. They also enable uh, people across our organization to have real-time access to their data. So we have service level dashboards uh, where managers and practitioners can have a look at their own data. Uh, but we also have aggregated dashboards that show national and, and state level data that are embedded on SharePoint and everybody across our whole organization has access to that. So it means that um, like our policy and advocacy team, they can uh, look at that and use the data to inform their positions or business development as well. Um, and the program managers can also sort of compare their individual service level data to maybe trends that they're seeing at a state or a national level as well. So data visibility is huge for us. Um, that's a real sort of game changer. But then we also have a big emphasis on our annual evidence to action process that services are expected to complete. So the staff are provided with a reflection tool that's been developed by that service design and innovation team who we, we work with so closely. Um, and then they have access to the data and they can be supported to explore what it means. So uh, we run workshops where we support people to review their data that might be done at a service level or we could potentially get together a number of services maybe within the same geographic area or running some similar services and explore what some of those insights are. Um, so we get subject matter experts involved. We have sort of homelessness specialists or say um, people in our family preservation teams as well who are specialists. So we get that sort of practice knowledge in, um, people from practice quality as well. Um, and then we really just unpack the data and unpack those um, insights. We celebrate the successes and think about how we could, you know, replicate that in other places. Um, and also get the contextual information from the practitioners and the managers, because obviously they know their clients, they know their communities so much better than we do. Um, and they can really provide um, that additional information that tells the story behind the data and really helps us to understand it. And then most importantly of all, once we've kind of gone through that process, uh, they come up with this evidence to action plan. So they identify some priority areas that they want to focus on over the next 12 months. Uh, it doesn't need to be anything super complicated. It could just be sort of two or three things that they want to change or try to do differently. And they sort of articulate what they expect that to look like in the data. We then run the data again in sort of 12 months time and go through the process with them to see if the changes they made have actually resulted uh, in the outcomes that they intended. So um, an example that we have of that is one of our youth homelessness services over in WA. They could see through their impact measurement data that when young people were leaving the service, they were quite unhappy with their future security and they were actually feeling quite anxious. So we explored that. Um, with the team and they identified that they could be more consistent in the way they celebrated achievements with the young people throughout their engagement um, in the service to really help the young people reflect on their own growing capacity and their own um, ability to be independent so that by the time they were actually leaving the service, they felt more equipped for the future to face the future without um, the support of the service. And they also decided to put um, some more effort into improving their exit planning process again so that young people would feel more supported through um, that exit process and feel um, kind of ready to leave by the time um, it, it was time to exit. So they, they made those changes. We reran the data a year later and we could actually see a measurable improvement in the scores that the young people were providing. So they were saying that they felt happier about the future and they were less anxious. So it was exactly the kind of change that we would want to see um, based on the data that we had originally presented. So that's uh, an example of our learning in action. Um, so now it's just our top five tips in summary. Um, we've talked a lot about all the different people that we engage through our mail process. It really is a team effort. We don't do this alone. Um, and it's really great to see that input from different people and the expertise that they bring. Another really key factor for us is the leadership buy-in that we have. Um, as Cherie mentioned, our mails link back to our strategy. We have really great support from our senior leaders. There's KPIs for our strategy that are attached to the work that we do. So it really helps us to get that, that buy-in that then feeds through to staff on the ground. 
technology is also super important and having that ecosystem and automation um, is essential. Like we said, Mission Australia is a huge organization. It has such a variety of services. If we had to do this manually, uh, it would be impossible. So IT are our best friends. Um, we, we talk with them all the time um, and also our BI team that help um, kind of bridge that gap between the IT technical people and, you know, people like me that don't know what a data lake is. So um, we really work collaboratively together to make the systems work for us um, and to make them work for the staff on the ground, because if the systems don't work for the staff on the ground, we're not going to have any data to um, analyze. Another really important thing to keep in mind is that this has been a phased long term project for Mission Australia. Um, it's something that we've been working on for, like I said, probably seven or even eight years in terms of laying the foundation for impact measurement, um, improving our systems. Like we've done a lot of work around our client record management system to improve the, the quality of the data that we get from that. Um, and we did take a phased approach to impact measurement and now a phased approach to metals as well. We test things, we pilot it, we see what works, we see what doesn't work, and then we make improvements. So we can't, you know, you can't just jump to the end. This is, has been a long-term um, project um, and we're really just starting to see the fruit of those, you know, eight years of work now. So that's really exciting. Uh, and like I said, um, as Cherie said, learning is the key thing. Um, there's no point in doing this uh, if we're not actually going to learn and change anything. We we want to end homelessness. We want to support as many people um, in the best way that we can. And we really want to apply the insights. And that's why we do what we do. Um, and not only does it result in those better outcomes for people, it also kind of helps reinforce the cycle because the more staff can actually see the data, can understand the insights, see the impact that it has, for the people that they work with, we get more buy-in in terms of like the quality of the data collection, um, the consistency of actually collecting feedback from, from clients because they see that it's not just data that's going into a black box and nothing ever happens to it. They can actually see um, the value for the people they work with, which is usually their, their main motivation. Um, so learning is kind of it, key for everything, I would say. So those are our, all of our tips. I think it's maybe over to Laura and any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Cherie. Um, please post your questions in the chat. Um, we're happy to do it either either by chat or just raise your hand um, and we can work around the room and, and see who has questions um, for Victoria and Cherie. To start us off, I had a, a quick question around the data set that you're building and then other data sets that are available. Um, so you mentioned the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare um, and then also New South Wales uh, customer service and health data as well. And I'm curious to see um, how easy it's been to link in with those data sets, gain access to them and, and what kind of value you're getting from that, um, from that combination of data sets. Yeah, good question, Laura. Um, it's been a bit of a process. Um, I think what we have done, uh, not strategically, probably opportunistically, um, is uh, pilot projects now that don't actually require data linkage. Does that make sense? So um, the projects with AIH AIHW, they actually already have our data because we report into them uh, monthly, all of our specialist homelessness services. So for them, it was just a conversation around, um, you can see the service system data, we would get great benefit from being able to understand, um, I guess, that trajectory from our services perspective so we're able to build that partnership um, and with the New South Wales Better Outcomes Lab um, to get access to the New South Wales Human Services data set um, it obviously needs to be focused on young people vulnerable young people and families so we were per originally pursuing two projects or two service types um, one was our youth AOD residential service and the second one was our youth homelessness services um, we ended up going with youth homelessness services because again at DCJ we which is a government department, already has all of our data because they're specialist homelessness services. So um, we don't necessarily need to go through that data linkage um, uh, process, uh, but we are 
going through that process now where we're doing for another project where we're doing a privacy impact assessment. So that's obviously taking a much longer um, time and we're going to be reviewing all of our like consent procedures and stuff as well. So the long-term vision is to do the data linkage, but at the moment we've um, chosen those projects where uh, our funders or partners already have the data available. Fantastic. Thank you. Isla, you've got your hand up. Yeah, look, thank you for a fantastic presentation. It's really um, interesting, exciting to see what's um, what's going on. Um, I just wondered, in the early days, how did you go about actually getting buy-in from the organisation for um, the whole male strategy and work that you wanted to do? Vic, do you want to start with impact measurement and then I can jump <laughs> in with you? Sure. Got the historic note. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the real key was getting um, our execs on board with it. So um, we, I guess, not our current CEO, but our, our previous CEO was uh, really sort of passionate about it. I mean, our current CEO is as well, I'm not saying she's not, but um, yeah, the I think getting the execs on board was really um, important. And then just testing it so there was you know a pilot in 2015-16 really listening to the staff and and then the champions uh was really important so as we developed the kind of impact measurement process we really took them along on the journey with us um and helped them to feel like they had some ownership of it so that when we sort of produced these surveys it wasn't you know random questions that they didn't think had any value it was questions that they'd actually had some sort of input into the development um and so we also just had a big comms push so like as we did the pilot they you know recorded interviews with practitioners and managers in services that had been using impact measurement to then talk about you know how they had actually used it in practice because you know as much as we can tell them it's great i think they sort of trust their colleagues in service delivery a bit more um, than us and then also within our own impact measurement and evaluation team we have staff who come from a service delivery background as well so I myself um, used to work in service delivery in uh, the Kimberley and WA so when people sort of talk about the challenges of working in sort of like remote contexts um, or with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities I can speak to that um, from my own experience um, and similarly other people in the team that um, come from that service delivery background can kind of help to bridge that gap as well. So I think kind of, again, it's that like multi-pronged approach that helps. And I guess, Isla, from my perspective, um, so I started in the organisation or in this role about two and a half years ago, um, and I think I was pretty fortunate that that kind of foundational work had been done, but those original conversations that I was having with leadership was around, we've got all this data, we actually need to now, uh, like, look at what does this actually mean and what does it mean for our services? So I would say I spent a good six to nine months um, just talking about what is MEL. Um, we ran demystifying sessions because people were like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I just really tried to strip it back to this is just about us making, uh, using and utilising all of the existing data that we have in the organisation. So strategically, we haven't introduced any new data sources because the organisation, the phase or the journey it's been on, we've just had had system after system after system. Um, the next few years is just around, we've got all this data, how can we actually use it and feed it back into services? Um, and I think over the last 12 months, the light bulb moment, moment for people has been actually seeing the data. So uh, putting together data packs, Vic and I worked on, I think, 68 different data packs for our homelessness services, even though there were dashboards as well, um, going out, talking about the data, um, having it become real for people to be like, oh, now we understand why we enter data that way and having those conversations around what it means has been really important. Thank you. I've got a question coming in from the chat here from Julie Elliott, um, just around the, the type of evaluation approach you're using. Um, so she's mentioned that the evaluation component seems to lean to a realist approach. If this is intentional, can you explain how this works within an inter within a transdisciplinary team. Uh, so for example, it could be the evaluation questions you pose. 
Yeah, great question. We don't lean towards any, I guess, evaluation, uh, specific evaluation approach. It would depend on the context of the projects they're working on. Uh, generally speaking, though, we lean more towards a utilisation focused evaluation approach where we are wanting no matter what through all our projects to feed data back into services as quickly as possible. That's our key. Um, the Life Course Centre one does take a realist approach in terms of uh, looking at what works for whom and in what context, um, but that's a specific project that they will be running does that make sense so uh it would just the approaches that we take really depends on the context and how we're working and the questions you want to answer fantastic um there's another one here from kieran galvin um so given the externalities facing the homelessness services sector for example the cost of living housing availability and inadequate government payments how do you account for these factors and the barriers they may present to success in homelessness services yeah, great question. Um, and we just acknowledge it. So even with that predictive analysis that Vic was talking about, we were really, really mindful that there's a wide variety of different external factors that are contributing to whether our programs can, can get people housing or not. Um, so we specifically for that kind of predictive modelling looked at what we believed were uh, modifiable service elements. So elements that we could have some control over, seeing we really have very limited control over what's happening in the external sector. Um, so we looked at things like length of service delivery, the types of support received, um, the intensity of support, things that we believed we could have some control over um, and ran that analysis. And as you can see, even with the predictive analysis, we didn't get to 100% of people got a home. I think we got up to 51% of people. Um, and that's really factoring in all of those external factors that are totally outside um, our control. But what we have been doing, though, is using that predictive analysis for advocacy purposes. Yeah, so going out, talking to people about our homelessness services. Um, the homelessness impact report, I think we reached around 3.2 um, million, I would say, uh, people, audiences. Uh, so just using our data to start that advocacy piece around the fact that we need an increased investment in social and affordable housing and we need to be addressing those external factors as well. So using the data from a um, policy and advocacy lens. Fantastic. Um, and I've got a couple of questions here, I think just for a, a bit more of a practical take on um, how you socialise Mel across Mission Australia, um, how you made the program team an ally in, in using this data and, um, and seeing impact from it. And then how did you get the senior leader leadership team on board with Mel? Yeah, good question. Great questions. Um, I think I've been able to we've been able to piggyback with the great success of the impact measurement program. The fact that the impact measurement program, which is all around us um, collecting and reporting on outcomes, has been well established. So we have I think it's ninety three percent of our services collect outcomes data. So that groundwork was done um, originally around you know we need this data for basically all of our funding contracts now. Um, but not only that, we also are really committed to measuring wellbeing across the organisation. So we want everybody uh, who comes into our organisation to feel better about themselves. And that really connects to people on the ground because they want that as well. Um, so what we're doing is essentially providing them with a way that they can be measuring their impact and, and having those conversations with people and with communities. So um, as Vic mentioned earlier, there's been years of work uh, to get that comms piece out to get people on board. Um, so when we started, I guess, talking about an integrated approach to impact measurement, which also is now MEL, um, uh, impact measurement is one of our monitoring data pieces that we use. It was really just continuing that conversation around, we have so much data in the organisation and we need to be looking uh, holistically at our services. So how they're being delivered, but also the outcomes that they are contributing towards um, and then demonstrating. So showing them the data, telling that story um, we didn't show it today but we in our monitoring and reporting framework we have signs of success which is uh, um, closely linked to our theories of change so every time we're presenting it we're talking about sorry signs of progress I should say uh, we changed it to get buy-in and engagement um, signs of progress uh, we're presenting in that, in that way what we're producing looks the same it looks nice interactive um, just different strategies that we're getting to get people interested in the data because I'm missing anything with that one 
Uh, no, I think just even like the data visibility is a big thing in terms of getting the, the program teams on board. We got some dashboards built into our client record management systems as well. So I think that really helped the practitioners to get on board because they could actually then, you know, see in real time the data for, for their own specific clients. So um, just, yeah, I think that's another, like when people can see it, uh, it makes them a lot more interested, I think. Thank you. Um, while we're on data, I'll, I'll just skip down to Mary's question. Um, are your service providers submitting data via a portal or a, um, a CRM? Also, do they or does Mission Australia on their behalf report data via a data exchange um, for the Department of Social Services funding purposes um, or for, for all of the funding received? Yep, great question. So we have our own uh, CRM um, that I think 80% of our services are using. Uh, it's called MA Connect in that fancy diagram that Vic showed before. Um, so our services uh, report data into MA Connect and then through our data lake, we then transfer data into our funders. So for example, DSS or DCJ or, um, you know, a range of different funders. So we don't um, encourage and we're getting better as we get new contracts coming on board. Uh, we wouldn't directly enter into a government system. We would be always looking at ways that we can push the data from our data lake. So we have visibility um, over it. And in terms of, so this next question relates to the um, cultural perspective that's put on Mel and whether there was any purposeful decisions that were taken um, around applying a cultural perspective, whether in the evaluation questions, the approach or how it was implemented. Yeah, so this has been um, a challenge for us. <laughs> I would say that probably one of our biggest challenges is around um, particularly how do we measure outcomes for our First Nations communities. Um, and it's something that we've been talking about for a long time. Um, we do have one evaluation project at the moment, which is our integrated accommodation um, and support program up in the Northern Territory, otherwise known as Baden Road. Um, and part of that evaluation that we're undertaking is actually looking at how we can develop a culturally appropriate, culturally safe way to collecting outcomes data. So we're engaging a First Nations consultancy up there to do that work for us um, and to start us really thinking about um, a better way for us to collect outcomes data. So we know the approach that we're taking at the moment doesn't work. Um, so we're really looking and how we can authentically um, work alongside our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff uh, and come up with some solutions or some ways around how we can be really measuring wellbeing. So it's going to be, now we've done that kind of foundational piece, a really strong focus over the next six months is around how we can be um, doing that much, much better. But it has been one of our biggest challenges. And just to follow up from me on that one, is that around what you're measuring and are the the impacts or the outcomes of value to those communities are they different or is it about the practice of actually collecting that data well, both <laughs> so it's essentially at the moment we use the personal well-being index so we get really strong feedback that it's not culturally safe or culturally appropriate um, and that's around the constructs of well-being uh, don't necessarily um, relate to our first nations communities but it's also actually just the process of sitting down with a survey um, and collecting data in that way as well. So I think we're pretty excited about um, being creative about it. Uh, we've said to the consultant up there, we just like, we we want to try something different. So, you know, it's not going to be a standardised tool. We get that. We're okay with that. Um, but it's just really important for us that we are providing a culturally safe and appropriate way um, to have conversations about wellbeing with all of our clients. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then from Ben, so in terms of the L in Mel, are you suggesting that the key step, uh, that the key is building it in as a step, the evidence to action process? So I'm not sure if I've read that correctly. Um, ben, did you want to provide a little bit more there or is that? <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, I think um, many of us perhaps don't pay enough attention to the L um, in the evaluation society. So I'm just wondering whether, you know, whether there's something more you want to say or whether you think the key is actually just to build it in. So it is a step, so you have to do it, and so it happens. 
Yeah, look, Ben, it's been one of the kind of key comms pieces that we've used. So even that slogan, it's all about the L in the mail, that's actually come from one of our executives. <laughs> he actually said that after a meeting that we had talking about why we're doing this and why it's important. Um, I think we spent quite a lot of time focused on compliance. So this had to happen, um, particularly in terms of impact measurement. But because we're now shifting it, uh, and shifting the conversation, it's now about the so what piece. And the so what piece is all about us um, creating space and creating time for people to come together and look at the data. So a lot of our evidence to action process is based on monitoring data, doesn't necessarily have to be an evaluation. It's the fact that we're sitting with them, um, looking at impact measurement, looking at the data from the client uh, management record, client record management system. Um, but then we have embedded it into evaluate the evaluation process. So we have an evaluation management procedure, um, which is in place in the organization. And that provides step-by-step, -step, um, I guess, uh, instructions or guidance around how we uh, project manage evaluations and it's in there. So there's a whole part around evidence to act action. So the expectation set before a uh, program even starts an evaluation that we don't do this for the shiny evaluation report, although that's really, really helpful to have, um, where actually the purpose of this is for us to learn as an organisation. So it's really continuously having those conversations and building that learning culture at different levels. Great, thank you. Thanks. Um, and then another one here from Nigel McPaul. What have your practi practitioners found most useful in the internal dashboards you've developed? Nigel, did you want to add anything to that? No, I'll throw a show my face while you're asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> Great. That's, no, that's always nice. I like Thanks. that, Nigel. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think, like, what we found initially was people were really good at uh, integrating impact measurement into the onboarding process and sort of having it as part of that initial assessment but then it would really kind of drop off when it came time to do you know follow-up assessments because we really wanted to them to do an impact measurement survey when they're doing case reviews um, and it also wasn't as well integrated into the kind of exit process so with the dashboards the staff can see when was the you know most recent survey done what did it show it reminds them to kind of do it again and then also really kind of visually shows them what has changed since the last time they did it so rather than have to look at what was the survey that you know they did three months ago and what's the survey now and sort of manually compare it it's actually sort of in their face so I think it really helps them to reflect on what's changing with the client um, and also just to to keep it front of mind in terms of part of their practice it also makes it easier for the managers to kind of track um, which clients have got surveys which clients don't you know when they need to do the follow-up so yeah I think that's been a game changer. Nigel I will say though what we probably didn't anticipate so much or maybe we did and, we, and we're now really focusing on it is around data literacy so particularly you know people on the ground we think oh we've done this beautiful interactive really fancy dashboard um, people are going to use it and they do they definitely use the impact measurement one um, but we do really need a piece now around data literacy just around um, using dashboards but also interpreting data and what does it mean what does it mean to practice so um, we're now planning to do some quarterly like capacity building work workshops and one of the topics will be around uh, dashboards so we're going to have a focus on that over the next 12 months um, because that is the key uh, portal I guess we want people to be going to to access their data so we do need to uh, build capacity at, at all different levels of the organization to feel comfortable with them using those Power BI reports. We face the same challenge thanks very much. Thank you. And one just in from, um, from Antoinette. Um, so evaluations help us to identify gaps in our business processes. Do you have an example of how Mel helped identify gaps in your business? 
Yeah, so a good example is the one that Vic spoke about before, which I spoke about as well, is around that predictive data analysis. So that was really um, based on our monitoring data set. Um, it clearly showed us that we needed to be engaging people for longer. So really simple stuff. We need to be keeping them um, engaged. We need to be keeping them on our service. Mm -hmm. um, when we went out and kind of socialised that and spoke to services around what does that actually mean, and one of the key things that we realized was we need to get better as a large organization uh, around connecting our, our the people who access our services to other Mission Australia services. So it, it's particularly in rural and regional areas where we have other services like community mental health or AOD, looking at ways that we might not be able to get a person a house straight away, but we can also work with that person to address some of those underlying risk factors for homelessness. So that. We might have known that on the ground, but having that kind of data, uh, monitoring data uh, front and centre um, really allowed us to be having those conversations on the ground. Um, and uh, hopefully we, we started having those conversations around six months ago and we did the homelessness impact report. Hopefully what we're going to see is some changes over time around how we engage people um, on the ground. But that was a big, I guess, um, thing that we didn't know. The other thing we didn't know was how important brokerage was. So we didn't talk about that in the analysis, but brokerage also came through as a really, really important factor um, for people who are experiencing homelessness. So again, something we can modify within our services, but we could see that a lot of our homelessness services, we're not, we're not using brokerage. So that's, I guess, was a big gap in our business processes. So working with people on the ground to really work out how they can embed brokerage within their um, support planning processes as well was a, another good example. In, in terms of those planning processes, so somebody's got a question in the chat, um, Ali, around Mel and when you plan that, is, does that come in at the program design stage or during the implementation of the program? Yeah, great question. So um, what we've piggybacked Mel on in our organisation is, as what Vic mentioned earlier, was our flagship service models. Um, so a lot of the flagship service models, um, that's all about grouping similar services together, which have common goals under one theory of change. So for example, we have very different homelessness service models. We've got 78 of them, but they're grouped under our homelessness and housing support flagship service model. So in that context, a lot of those services were actually already existing, but it was about bringing them together, identifying the theory of change, and then introducing the concept of MEL, um, and that we're using MEL to find out what's working really well, to find out what may not be working. Um, and then new services that we get contracts for are onboarded onto that MEL process. So we've got a bit of a mixture happening because we've kind of come in with MEL when we already have 400 services in the organisation. Um, so we're working backwards with them, but when we're getting new contracts on board, that's an onboarding process, and um, we start the conversation at the beginning then.